101 Eastern. Welcome to Vision, a show about the trends, ideas, and disruptions changing the face of our democracy. Over the past few weeks on the show, we've been just approaching the question of free speech, expression, and press freedom in different ways. Uh, we've discussed the unique challenges that digital technology poses for how we think about free speech, both in a legal context and as a bedrock part of our democratic culture. We've also discussed intense debates about what some would call the zone of deviance, what to do with the views that we might consider obsolete outside the mainstream, reprehensible, or some combination of all three, and what action, if any, can or should we reasonably take to curb these views? Or is the mere impulse to restrain the expression of any sentiment an anathema to the basic principles of our democracy? UCLA law professor Eugene Volokh has been one of the most persistent and forceful proponents of the First Amendment uh, and a longtime commentator on these issues whose work is widely cited in a legal context and uh, in mainstream thought. He was also early to capitalize on the power of the internet to spread ideas and discussion, founding the now famous blog, The Volokh Conspiracy. Delighted to have him with us today. Please welcome to the show, Eugene Volokh. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for being with us. Um, I'd love to sort of, I mean, you really are, are one of the key commentators, observers and scholars of the, of the First Amendment. And so I'd love to start by just having you um, give us a sense of sort of the status of free speech, both in a First Amendment context, you know, what's the status of the law of, of this set of rights, um, but also culturally, to the extent that the idea that f there's a, that the, the marketplace of ideas that free and open discourse is sort of a critical part of the liberal American democratic project, what the state of the culture as well. So just give us a sense of sort of how you see the world of expression and speech. Well, when it comes to First Amendment rules as enforced by the courts, they're about as broad as they've ever been. Uh, the Supreme Court, both the conservatives and the liberals on it are pretty committed to protecting a broad range of free speech against government suppression. Um, uh, uh, there are some dissenters on both the conservative and liberal side, and uh, different cases bring out different different dissents. But on balance, uh, it seems quite clear that the court is fully prepared to protect a wide range of speech, including so-called hate speech and uh, uh, a speech that may indirectly lead to violence and various other such things. Um, at the same time, very few disputes actually reach the U.S. Supreme Court, and very few reach even the courts directly, because First Amendment law is not meant to handle all controversies about free speech. So to take one example, um, what about uh, uh, free speech for private employees who are afraid they'll get fired uh, if they say the wrong thing? Well, it turns out that about half of the public lives uh, in states that have state laws that protect uh, employees' uh, uh, speech against their private employers. The First Amendment, of course, doesn't apply to private entities, but those laws do. Uh, what's the status of free speech under that? A lot harder to tell because there are many fewer lawsuits filed, and it's hard to tell whether it's because actually employers rarely fire employees for their political speech, or whether it's because lawyers don't know how to file those lawsuits, or it's too expensive or too difficult for employees to fight this sort of thing. Um, likewise, uh, what about free speech in the sense of willingness of college students to speak out about various topics? Uh, again, at public universities, generally speaking, they have pretty broad legal protection against uh, being disciplined for, let's say, saying things in a student newspaper or in a conversation or what have you. Uh, a few, we've seen some examples of universities that I think violate the First Amendment on this, but, uh, uh, but not a lot do. Uh, at private universities, there are pretty strong norms, I think, uh, preventing private universities from outright expelling students for for their their speech, although again there you know it depends on the university and the speech. Uh, but when we're talking about sort of social pressure, like somebody saying I'm afraid I'll lose friends, I'll lose future business prospects or job prospects, especially if you say at a law school where in a year or two you're going to be out there practicing law and maybe the person who is in law school with you a year ahead is going to be helping decide whether to hire you for some job. Uh, there, I think people are a lot more concerned, but part of the problem is it's a lot, it, it's a lot harder to figure out what to do about that because, you know, uh, we do uh, choose our friends and choose even prospective employees based in part on how smart they seem, how nice they seem, how pleasant they are to be around, and what you say may influence people's judgment on that. Uh, so there, it's a lot harder to talk even in terms of free speech as such. Uh, to give another example, I don't think the government should punish Stalinists. 
but I'm not going to have any Stalinists over for dinner, and I'm not going to be particularly keen on helping them out uh, for various tasks, likewise with Nazis. Uh, so those things are a lot harder to figure out. My sense is uh, that uh, we've gotten to a situation where there is a lot less tolerance of, of, uh, of views, including ones that are loosely, descriptively mainstream. So let me suggest one thing especially to educational institutions, but I think also a lot of other institutions. It's really important that if a view is held by 20% of the public, that there be people around who can express that view without fear of being expelled or fired or losing jobs and such, because everybody else needs to hear that view, needs to understand what that view is and needs to figure out how to argue against it. They may think it's a very bad view, but especially, let's take an example that I know well, law schools, you know, if even if you think that support for um, um, for uh, sharp restrictions on abortion is completely wrong, even if you want to become an advocate for abortion rights, you especially want to hear what is something that 40 percent of the public, maybe in some situations, 60 percent, maybe at least 20 percent of the public believes, because otherwise, how will you learn how to effectively argue against that? So that kind of tolerance of rival views both as an ethical matter, but also as an instrumental matter, as a means of making sure that people hear these various arguments, and even if they think they're totally benighted, figure out what it is that much of the rest of the public is uh, uh, believes, that I think there's a lot less of. And I think that's, that's bad, although that may not be something that the law uh, can, can reach. Yeah, let's, let's talk a bit about that sort of cultural discussion, because I think one, you know, to the extent that that matters out that 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 there's a view that we are trying to we have a, a public culture that supports our democracy and so even outside the law's reach it may or may not be important to support that public culture strikes me as worth 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 exploring but also it certainly seems to be a, one of the stakes around our debate about expression is is sort of the openness of the culture and it strikes me in thinking about you know the example that you just gave about views is you know there's sort of both sides of this debate to be you know, somewhat reductionist for the purposes of this discussion, are sort of accuse the other side of, sort of a kind of a pretextual argument, right? So I think you've got some that say, you know, there are those on the left who just want to stamp out uh, all views they don't agree with. They want us all to think the same thing about what's just or what's equitable. And, um, and, and so they're using values like a more inclusive environment as a pretext for their view has to be ascendant. And then I think you would have some on the left who would say, um, look, there are real imbalances of power here. And the idea that we need to cultivate an open marketplace in which different ideas can come, um, can be heard fairly to sort of improve our general understanding, to hone our own arguments for why to maybe dismiss those arguments we don't agree with, et cetera, all of the sort of salutary benefits of the marketplace of ideas, that's just a pretext um, to allow this person to kind of continue to enforce this power imbalance. Um, that favors that favors their view. I, I imagine these sorts of discussions are happening on your campus and certainly uh, in other campuses uh, that you've observed. How do you how do you sort of evaluate these kind of political manifestations of, of this of this debate? Well, I'm I tend to be not terribly interested in most situations in questions of whether whether some something is pretext or not. Mm -hmm. Partly because it's really hard to figure out what is it the other side sincerely believes. Partly because the other side is a lot of people. So maybe a few of them, I can, I find leaked copies of emails from them where they say, ha, 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 uh, we're claiming we're in favor of free speech, but really we're just trying to, to better suppress the other side's views. But then there'll be other people for whom I can't find those emails, but because no such emails exist, because they actually do sincerely uh, um, uh, 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 support free speech. So what's the point of my making an argument, at least if I'm trying to get at the truth rather than just political victory, yeah. what's the point of make my making an argument about, uh, about the person's pretext uh, 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 when, it's, when that doesn't really tell us what the right answer is? Now, I'm sure there have been times when I've focused on pretext, and in some situations it's relevant, in some legal questions, for instance, what the actual basis for a decision is, is, is relevant. But I'm less interested in what people are really motivated by and more what are sensible rules. So to take an example, um, there's no doubt that there is a vast range of power imbalances, uh, and they, they, do, they, of course, operate in different ways in different contexts. So, for example, uh, Islam is relatively less powerful in the sense of a set of people who hold a particular complex of views uh, in the U.S., just because there are a lot fewer people. Uh, who, uh, uh, who are Muslims than, uh, than say, who are, who are Christians uh, or even who are atheists. Uh, 
On the other hand, in the world at large, Islam is, of course, is a tremendously powerful force. And in some countries, Islam is the dominant force and, and, is, and at least some facets of it are an are oppressive, uh, oppressive force. Uh, so, uh, so likewise, you know, are conservatives more powerful than liberals? Well, it depends. In some states, probably they are to the point where maybe some liberals are reluctant to express their views on certain subjects for fear they're going to be blacklisted in the job market in this particular area. At the same time, on at least at my university campus, it's pretty clear that liberals are much more powerful. Liberals on to the left of liberals, let's say the left of the spectrum is much more powerful uh, than, than conservatives. So, uh, so I, I, there are obviously these power imbalances. The question is what to do about it when it comes to uh, free speech and suppressing the views of the ostensibly powerful in order to further the views of the less powerful, or if you prefer, in order to provide a broader balance is I think a pretty, uh, uh, is generally speaking pretty unsound move for a couple of reasons. First of all, all suppression requires some power to implement it. By definition, the truly powerless will not, never be able to suppress uh, uh, contrary views uh, or, even, or even regulate or restrict if you want to use less, uh, uh, less value-laden terms, contrary views, because by hypothesis, they're so powerless, they, they wouldn't have the power to implement those things. So when you see restrictions on speech, invariably the restrictions are implemented by entities or movements or people who are powerful in that context. Uh, and then, so the restriction is presumed is then on people who are generally less powerful. Uh, on top of that, I think, you know, sometimes the powerful have really good ideas. Sometimes they have bad ideas. Sometimes the powerless have good ideas. Sometimes they have bad ideas. Uh, so I think the important question is how do we promote a wide range of ideas? Now, one way of thinking about it is when I'm in the classroom, I want to make sure that both sides and maybe more than two sides of each issue are raised. I don't view it in terms of who's the more powerful in class. And maybe in some class, it's not that anybody is more powerful. It's just that some particular group of people are more vocal and the others are just not as interested. I'm going to go out of my way to make sure that both sides are presented because it's my job to, to teach students how to deal with both sides. Uh, and how to teach law, future lawyers how to make arguments on both sides. To me, that's not a question of trying to tamp down the powerful voices and amplify the powerless voices. To me, it's just a question of making sure that both sides, both sides are heard. And that makes a lot of sense when we're not talking about restricting what is said in the lunchroom or online, but orchestrating what goes on in my classroom. Likewise, if you're putting together a conference, it you, often makes sense for you to make sure that the panel is balanced, not in a way that you'd impose as a speech code on the public at large or on students at large, but just to make sure that, again, both sides are prevent, presented or maybe four sides are presented in, in, in a panel of four people. Uh, so, so I do think that it makes sense to make sure that various arguments are, are raised. I think just framing it in terms of power is not terribly helpful. How do you, how do you respond in particular to... Um, to to you know arguments that are raised, for example, um, by um, by stu you know, stu the classroom would be a good example. The students who say, um, you know, look, air airing uh, you know X particular view in in this way, um, you know, is a really traumatic experience for me. And so, whether you think that's material harm or not, it certainly excludes me from the conversation. And it and it's traumatic for me because of a context. Um, that I bring in, that we all bring in before we get in the classroom. So even if your idealized classroom is a place where all views can be aired, you have to accept the fact that I'm not, I don't just exist in this law classroom. I come in this classroom as someone who, you know, maybe had been uh, on the receiving end of some, you know, I'm thinking of racial epithets that maybe are used for pedagogical reasons as examples. Um, that, that Those terms were used for a very specific purpose for a very long period of time for the deliberate purpose of oppression and I, how can I, how can I really feel included in this classroom if I can't divorce my full self um, from, from, from the moment in which the term is being used? How have you encountered or evaluated those sorts of, those sorts of arguments? Well, so I'm a law professor and maybe, maybe the analysis might be different to professors and other disciplines. I, I can't speak for that with confidence, although I have some suspicions, but I'm a law professor, which means I have to train future lawyers. And future lawyers have to um, uh, be prepared to work in an environment where they're going to hear 
a wide range of things being pressed, sometimes at great length and with great detail, that they may find offensive, traumatic, if you prefer, whatever, uh, whatever you want. It's kind of like uh, doctors and blood. And it, it's natural to be upset at blood and gore and death, but if you're going to be trained to be a doctor, you need to prepare yourself for that. Likewise, if you want to be a psychotherapist, uh, it's natural to be very upset at people recounting stories of how they were abused or maybe fantasies about how they may want to abuse somebody. It's perfectly natural. And for some people, it's even more so because the would-be psychotherapist is going in there having been abused herself, let's say, as a child or himself as a child. Um, but you have to be prepared for that as a psychotherapist. So likewise uh, with lawyers, look, uh, um, uh, if you, uh, uh, um, uh, if you look, if you do a search on Westlaw for racial epithets, you will find literally tens of thousands of court cases in which racial epithets are quoted from the record. Uh, you will find them from justices on the right and judges on the right, judges on the left. You'll find them in opinions by Justice Sotomayor, by Justice Ginsburg, by Judge Pragerson, Ninth Circuit, a liberal titan who died a few years ago. Uh, this is what you're going to deal with because the legal system has to deal with this. People testify in court. This is what this person called me, uh, right? Uh, um, and uh, uh, and uh, you need to be prepared for that uh, if you are going to do a good job on behalf of your, uh, of your client. So you may need, you may be in a position where right there, you're on the spot and somebody quotes some racial epithet. And if you, if you feel traumatized and if you freeze up at that point, you will be doing a bad job. So the best way we can find of trying to figure out a deal with that is to actually in, to, to, uh, to make sure that uh, in the, when you're in the classroom, you learn to be prepared for that kind of thing uh, when, when there's a lot less at stake. But, but it's funny, people mention racial epithets, but think of so much more traumatizing things. I mean, imagine, imagine somebody talking about, uh, uh, about rape. And uh, probably in every class, there have been some people, uh, predominantly women, but not only, who've been raped, whether forcibly or molested as children or whatever else. They're, if it's a criminal law class, if they're going to become criminal lawyers, they have to learn to deal with that. What's more, they have to learn to hear arguments saying, oh, that woman, she's lying about being raped. Uh, or, uh, uh, or we need to be able to introduce evidence of her past sexual history in order to discredit her. In fact, sometimes they may need to make those arguments themselves on behalf of their clients. Uh, I could certainly see why people might find it difficult in the classroom to make those arguments or even hear those arguments being made, but we can't train them as lawyers if we constantly shield them from these things that are a normal part of legal practice. And again, I think about psychotherapy or uh, counseling or various other kinds of things. If you're not prepared to hear even things that are really quite offensive in various ways uh, from, from your client, not when the client is insulting you, but when the client is talking about an incident that happened in his life, whether he was the guilty party, often a lot of your clients might be, or that he was the victimized party. If you're not prepared to deal with that, you're not going to be a good psychotherapist. So Likewise with lawyers. So if we adopt sort of that kind of functionalism perspective, like the question is, what is the, what's the kind of function of the environment? You know, another place that this debate has come up recently, of course, is in newsrooms, right? And you have, I think, kind of two competing versions of functionalism. So, you know, one is, so I, you know, the, obviously the most notable example of this is um, the debate that erupted at the New York Times over the, an op-ed by Senator Tom Cotton, um, ultimately led to the dismissal of the op-ed page editor, James Bennett. Now, there was wrapped up in that questions of whether, you know, the sort of the job was done well around editing it. But certainly a big part of what sparked the discussion was the appearance of the op-ed, which for, the, you know, those who haven't followed this, uh, it made the argument for deploying federal troops uh, in order to help uh, quell the, some of the protests happening after the, the killing of George Floyd. And, um, you know, there you're now seeing, for example, in newsrooms, a discussion where it used to be sort of the thought that there's a newsroom, there's an op-ed page, and the whole point of the op-ed page is to get lots of different views, including views that maybe some would find really challenging. And you're now hearing um, arguments that say, um, well, look, th that's not our job. Our job isn't just to get any view. We haven't been publishing op-eds by, you know, leading Klan, Ku Klux Klan leaders for a long time. Our job is to sort of exp to provide the zone of debate um, that's within some sort of range uh, of, of acceptable opinions, maybe sometimes to push the boundaries of that. Um, but that, that really is our job. How, do you, how have you reacted to, to, what you, to what you've witnessed around some of those discussions with, again, an environment that has a sense of its own function? 
um, in the way that law school, law school classrooms have a really keen sense of what their function is and what they're preparing either lawyers or society for. So I think you're quite right that the frame is a matter of function. And I think one thing that's worth keeping in mind is uh, in, the, uh, in the media uh, uh, field, uh, even in the loosely new, uh, newsy media field, there have long been institutions that have had different functions. So uh, throughout, as I understand in much of the 1900s and into this century, the uh, mainstream newspaper has envisioned itself as being a place which is relatively neutral in its news coverage and broad-minded in its op-eds. Uh, and the sense was, sorry about that, the sense was uh, that this is what's most valuable to readers. Now, that wasn't what newspapers were like in the 1800s, and in part it was a reaction, I think, to newspapers in the 1800s and 1700s, but it's also not like what magazines, many magazines are like, not all, but many. We don't expect the National Review to publish a lot of liberal perspectives, even perfectly sensible mainstream liberal perspectives. We don't expect the New Republic to publish a lot of conservative perspectives. If they did, they'd stop being the National Review and the New Republic, right? Uh, that becomes something else, maybe something valuable, but then something valuable will be lost. Uh, at the same time, though, the consequence is when something is, when we hear something's published in the National Review, we know where it's coming from. We know that it's probably going to have certain kinds of biases, uh, likewise, again, in the New Republic. Uh, we, we expect it to be honest, but we don't expect it to be necessarily quite as fair-minded as what we are hoping to see in the New York Times, uh, in its news pages, or in the aggregate of its op -eds. So if the New York Times wants to say what a lot of its critics have been saying about it already, which is we're a liberal newspaper, yeah. we have a particular slant, this is our slant, you're gonna see it in our editorials, which everybody expects, that's fine. Uh, we're gonna, you're going to see it on our op-ed page, and inevitably you're going to see it on our news coverage too, because it becomes very hard to maintain not just an editorial policy that's on side, but also an op-ed policy that excludes some things as being kind of ridiculously evil uh, and not uh, have that leak into the, into the news coverage as well. So if that's what the New, the New York Times wants to be, you know, I think that's fine. But I think we have to understand that that's going to be both a cost to its credibility, or at least its credibility as a particular organization, and a cost to its readership. So what should an op-ed page have? Uh, now, I don't think an op-ed page, even in a mainstream balanced newspaper, can be viewpoint neutral in its coverage or content neutral. It's, it's impossible. In fact, the whole point of an op-ed page is to for the editors to select viewpoints that are of interest to the readers that are going to be kind of presented in an interesting way. Uh, but I do think one important test is, is this a view that is held by a substantial minority, at least of the public, or, and almost always there's some coincidence in, in a democracy, by a substantial minority of influential government officials, yeah. or maybe not even just government officials, yeah. influential people. If it is, then the readers ought to know about it. They ought to hear about it for a couple of reasons. One is it's valuable for readers to see what even the other side is thinking. If a senator and an influential senator is saying something, then you don't want these readers to be blindsided one day when it does become policy. Say, How come I never heard about it? Well, it's because your newspaper was protecting you from it. Um, and also on top of that, there's also the possibility that they may be right and that you may be wrong. That kind of epistemic humility, it seems to me, uh, is, uh, is a sensible attitude. You don't, you're not completely humble. You're not going to publish the uh, young earthers saying, oh, you know, the world was created 6,000 years ago. Yeah, we're pretty confident that's not right. But as to how you deal with, uh, uh, with uh, 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 mass violence, and while protests are, uh, uh, many aspects of them are peaceful, there certainly is plenty of violence going on, at least in certain places. How do you deal with it, especially if it appears in your nation's capital? Uh, and not just sometimes violence, sometimes vandalism of important cultural, uh, cultural landmarks uh, is an interesting and important question. You might feel pretty confident that the right answer is X, but you ought to have a little bit of skepticism about your conference to the point where if we think that 40 percent of the public thinks the answer is Y, we ought to hear at least the, mo the most interesting and best articulated explanation of that. So I think that's good. Again, that's not what we expect from the National Review or the New Republic. And if the New York Times wants to say we're going to be the New Republic of, of newspapers, that we're going to be, have a, a candidly uh, moderate liberal perspective and maybe 
do things within some zone of this moderate liberal center of ours, which is basically the far left first and then the center, somewhere in between, that's fine. But I think they have to understand that, uh, uh, that there, there's a cost to that, uh, uh, that they were been trying to avoid by having a more mainstream, oh, excuse me, more ecumenical view for many decades now. So I, one of the things I, I wanted to ask about in, um, that, that sort of flows from this and it's coming up in our question section, um, uh, some of the questions we're getting from the audience, which is about sort of the internet and how the internet has changed or, 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 or influenced our thinking about this is, it seems to me that um, a key animating part of arguments for making claims on speech, either as a matter of the law or as a matter of norms, is some articulation that the words are causing a, a kind of harm. Sometimes that's psychic. That's the example of the classroom. I think in the Tom Cotton op-ed case, you know, there, what was reported that some of the staff members felt uh, they felt unsafe, uh, in fact, because he was making an argument to instrumentalize state violence in a way that they felt would disproportionately uh, affect them. And I raise this in the context of the internet because I think this is certainly the animating idea on the internet. It's that there's something about the experience of being um, receiving hate speech being harassed, being trolled at the sort of scale and intensity of the internet, of being exposed to misinformation, you know, at the sort of scale and intensity of the internet that makes it a place where I think a lot of people are particularly concerned um, about whether as a matter of the law, maybe not as a matter of, of, of sort of the doctrine of First Amendment free speech, but as a matter of the law, we ought to do more to, to create standards of responsibility for the kinds of ideas, content, expression that people should be exposed to. And I'm curious to think about how you, how you think about the, that question of harm, but also the, the, the digital dimension of that question. Right. So one thing that I always try to impress on my students is that uh, uh, speech, the protection we offer speech does not come from the sense that speech is harmless. If speech were harmless, then it seems pretty likely it would be benefitless too. Uh, that if speech were harmless because speech never leads to, to people acting badly, then it'd be hard to see why it would lead to people acting well. Speech can be quite influential, and it can be influential for good, as, and it can be influential for ill. And if you want an example of that, let's look at the famous, uh, the famous, excuse me, the Supreme Court's uh, most prominent and really pretty much only uh, squarely decided hate crime case. Supreme Court has said you can't restrict so-called so, so hate speech, but you can restrict hate crimes. And which is to say you can impose higher penalties on uh, assault or murder or vandalism or, or other crimes that are motivated by the targets, race, religion, sexual orientation, and such. So let's look at the facts of Wisconsin v. Mitchell. Uh, so the defendant, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Todd Mitchell, uh, was watching together with several other young black men and boys the movie Mississippi Burning. And then shortly afterwards, uh, uh, the, there was a group, uh, the, the group of people moved outside, I'm reading from the opinion, and Mitchell asked them, do you all feel hyped up to move on some white people? Shortly thereafter, a young white boy approached the group on the opposite side of the street where they were standing. As the boy walked by, Mitchell said, you all want to fuck somebody up? There goes a white boy, go get him. Uh, they attacked him. Uh, they beat him unconscious. He was in a coma for four days. So if you're talking about pure cause and effect, I think it is fair to say that the movie Mississippi Burning, which is of course about an important, uh, I, I think we're very well regarded movie about a very important incident from the civil rights era where there was an attack on, um, I think murder of, of several whites by, by, of, of several blacks by, by, by whites. And actually I don't think it was just, just blacks, but in any case, murder by white racists in, in, in the South. Um, uh, so, so, but if you look at it from a purely causal perspective, the watching of the movie Mississippi Burning led to almost led to, to murder and at the very least led to an extraordinarily severe assault. What do you do about that? I think our answer is, well, it's true. A lot of speech does indeed help causally contribute to some bad behavior by a, some small fraction of the audience. But we can't restrict speech simply because of that tendency. Likewise, a lot of harsh criticism of police uh, may lead to, to few attacks on police, physical attacks, and I think there's evidence that it has, as well as possibly a lot of really very important uh, uh, reforms of police. 
Uh, the same thing is true with all movements, all movements uh, and all speech. There's labor speech, uh, anti-abortion speech, anti-war speech, various other kinds of things. There are going to be there's going to be some people who act on it in a violent uh, uh, a way or a criminal way, and, and there are going to be other people who don't. So so. The law has come to the conclusion that you can't suppress speech, even when we do see that in some measure it causes violence, except in extremely rare and narrow circumstances. But it's not just because the justice has just decided this on high one day uh, uh, through philosophical reasoning. It's because for the 50 years before, they've been struggling with similar examples where, in fact, the government did get away with restricting speech. For example, uh, advocacy of a uh, uh, communist revolution did get away with restricting such speech because of the fear that it would lead to, to crime and violence. Uh, and then the justices in ref uh, on reflection concluded that allowing those kinds of restrictions was a mistake. Uh, and I think it continues to be a mistake today, regardless of whether the target of the restrictions is far left advocacy or far right advocacy or anything in between. But let's, so, but there's, it seems to me, with, with particularly with regard to digital communication, there's, there's two arguments about harm. So one, I think, is similar to the, to the case that you cited in which, um, you know, when people talk about, uh, you know, certain web forms, 4chan, 8chan, being a, the sort of a place of safe harbor for extremist views, I think that's the more instrumental view. There's a lot of speech here that is riling someone up, and we we think that it should be restricted um, because it enables people to perpetrate you know some of the acts of violence that we've seen in recent year. You know, Temple of uh, of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. You know, there, there's this debate about whether uh, right. New Zealand whether this is enabled. But then there's another argument around this speech, right, which is to argue that it's a direct kind of harm, right? So, and, and there are interesting accounts, right, people who have been the victims of, um, of you know, brigading and other kinds of internet uh, harassment who, you know, they describe the experience, something about the experience of not one person uh, attacking you uh, personally or because of your identity, but, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people, uh, you know, it, with a kind of instantaneity that feels, some people will say, you know, it feels like it's the whole world is collapsing in on me. They're describing a real sort of psychophysical experience. Do you, do you make a distinction between an, that, the, an argument about instrumental harm that just happens to be digitized versus an argument that this is this certain kinds of speech amplified by the internet is really a direct kind of harm on me? Well, I was focusing on the, on the uh, uh, potential of, of uh, violent action yeah. because that's yeah. what I think you were getting at with the cotton op yes, Although yes, there, absolutely. the concern was the government would act in violent, violent ways. Well, the government, its job isn't often to act in violent ways. And yeah. then I think it's important to have a debate about which kinds of government violence are proper and which are not. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, but when you're, the, the point you're describing is I think a very interesting and important point. It reflects the fact that we're all social creatures. We have evolved to care about the views of our fellows. Uh, and uh, it's totally understandable that people would be quite upset about these, this kind of mass criticism. Part of the problem though, is if you look at the, at the labels people give, brigading, cyberbullying, harassing, those aren't exactly well-defined legal terms. Harassment actually is defined in the law, which is defined very different ways in different contexts, and sometimes defined quite vaguely. Brigading, cyberbullying, by and large, this is not something in which there's a very, very firm uh, definition. And then, so one might want to ask, well, what is that definition, and what exactly will it cover? And I think once one gets to that, one sees the difficulty of trying to suppress that kind of speech. So, for example, you talk about sort of mass criticism. Well. You know, this is what a lot of people experience when they post something online that some people say is racist or uh, Islamophobic or homophobic or whatever else. And they see all of the sharp criticism, uh, which ranges from some of it may be actually outright death threats, which are unprotected by the First Amendment. Some of it may be really substantive, calm, polite responses. And much of it may be in between, like, oh, this person is a fool. This person is an idiot. This person deserves to be fired. You could imagine a law that says, well, this is all harassment and brigading, and that uh, uh, any time you, uh, uh, anytime there's a group of people who are sharply criticizing somebody using insulting terms or calling for them to be fired, then that will be a crime. Although then one might wonder, well, is, is it a, uh, when, when does it start becoming a large group and what happens, how do you decide who, is the, who are the ones who get in as the initial critics and who are no longer allowed? You can imagine a situation at that point, the person could get an injunction, an order saying enough is enough, you've criticized me enough, now you can't criticize me anymore. You could imagine that it's not consistent with First Amendment law, but we can talk about changing First Amendment law, but, but, but at least we have to consider that it's going to end up 
covering a lot of criticism, including some fairly legitimate criticism, it seems to me. Uh, now, you could say, well, only racist criticisms we're going to, uh, we're going to, uh, we're going to ban. But anti-racist criticisms, no matter how brigading they may be, no matter how much they may threaten a person's livelihood, well, that's okay. Well, that's not going to fly under existing First Amendment law, and I don't think the court will be persuaded to change its views because that is overt viewpoint discrimination yeah. of the sort that the court has expressly and repeatedly condemned. Uh, uh, but yes, if you'd like to talk about some such things, it, it would be nice to do that. And that, again, it would, it would be good to have a good definition of harassment and brigading, a good, uh, 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 good set of test cases, some from the left, some from the right, some from the center. So, so our judgment isn't too much influenced about, uh, by our own uh, uh, prejudices in favor of one group or, uh, or, or another. Uh, I will say that the most prominent example of this from the pre-internet era is case called NAACP v. Claiborne Hardware, decided by the Supreme Court in 1982, but the fact pattern was from the 1960s. And that involved an NAACP called boycott, uh, by uh, by blacks of um, uh, Claiborne of white owned stores in Claiborne County, and some blacks didn't want to go along with that boycott. So what happened was their names were taken down outside the stores at which they were shopping. They were read in, uh, in they were distributed in mimeographs and read in black churches in the neighborhood. Which in a sense, my sense of that culture at the time was that uh, it was kind of like being posted on the internet because yeah. uh, uh, pretty much everybody, all your neighbors time. went. Yeah, exactly. uh, and yeah. there was a little bit of violence against people who didn't comply with the boycott. And there was certainly social ostracism. And the Supreme Court unanimously said this is constitutionally protected speech. Maybe it was wrong. But again, that's the kind of test case we'd like to think about when we're talking about these proposals. So final question before we let you go. Um, what do you what are what's a question or principle or idea um, that you would leave us with to sort of animate animate or orient how you think we should be thinking about either the law of free speech or culture of free speech? What's a, as you think about what kind of the right or, or best paradigm is for approaching these issues, given the kinds of debates that we're seeing, what's a, what sort of a positive idea you'd leave us with to, that you think should orient our thinking about what's right? Well, um, there's, I think, a general way of thinking about this. In a sense, it's kind of obvious, maybe a little banal, but I think sometimes it's worth repeating the obvious, which is you got to keep in mind that both the rules and the social norms that you're developing are going to be used against you and your friends and people on your side of the aisle, even at the same, uh, um, even though you may only want them to be used against the other side. Uh, and uh, uh, that's true in part because the country is currently quite, uh, quite divided. You may be in a majority and you could be conservatives or liberals. You could be in a majority in one state and very much in the minority in another state. It's also temporarily divided that, well, you could be in power in, in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. one year and not the next year. Um, if you want the government to have more power to restrict speech, that government could be the Trump administration. And even if you're completely confident that President Trump will be voted out of office, and I think it's a mistake to be confident about anything uh, in these kinds of contexts, pretty clear that at some point there'll be somebody else in office who's going to have views you disapprove of. So the question is, what is the tool that you are giving them. Another way of thinking about it is one of the strong protections these days for a wide range of speech is precisely the precedent set decades ago and endorsed by the court and is enshrined as First Amendment rules by the court involving very different kinds of, uh, uh, of speech. So, so, so now you have some speech which might be viewed as as, uh, uh, as racist or some claim is racist that is being protected because of uh, case law that was developed uh, in the 1950s and, uh, excuse me, especially the 1960s and 70s to protect civil rights speech and to protect extremist speech on the other side, protect communist speech as a reaction to the suppression of the 1950s. But then some of those cases turned in part because of previous cases where there was protection uh, offered to racist speech. So, for example, there's a case NAACP v. Button where the winner was the NAACP, where one of the things the court said, look, we've already provided protection for anti-Semites and for racists and such in past decisions. Obviously, this applies as much as to the NAACP. Likewise, you know, I think we have an example of cancel culture prom prominent, writ prominently, and I don't like that term because it's so vague as well. But I hope the analogy uh, helps show, uh, show the specific meaning I have in mind, uh, which is the 1950s Hollywood blacklist, right? A lot of the arguments we're hearing that, well, you should, 
Why should anybody have to deal with and have to keep hiring people who they think have evil views? Why shouldn't they be free to not to associate with those people? Those are the arguments for the Hollywood blacklist. Like, why should we hire um, screenwriters and others who support a political system that, in which we might be killed because we're capitalists, or at least uh, our, our rights and property would be taken away? And what's more, a lot of our audience doesn't want to see us supporting communists either, so we'll just blacklist them. Now, you might think that that was actually a good idea. You might think that the reaction to the Hollywood blacklist was a mistake, but it's important to realize that uh, uh, the, the tools that are, that are being validated um, in one era will be easily used against others in, in not so long from now. And conversely, to the extent that the reaction to the Hollywood blacklist was to protect people uh, from this kind of a, a restriction, uh, that that's one reason why we are seeing, I think, a lot of pushback against uh, some aspects of, let's just say, calls for firing people for supposedly extremist views and the like today. Well, as expected, uh, provocative, inci provocative and incisive. Eugene is incredibly prolific, so you should check out his work. We'll send you uh, a link to his, uh, to his webpage at UCLA. You can also follow him on Twitter uh, at Volek C, uh, and you can read uh, The Volek Conspiracy at reason.com backslash Volek. Um, again, we'll put this out by email, but Eugene, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, uh, very much my pleasure. Very much my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Anytime. All right, uh, before we go, everyone, I want to tell you about what's coming up on uh, Vision. Next week, we're going to have Jessica Gonzalez. She's CEO of the organization Free Press and one of the lead organizers of the Stop Hate for Profit campaign that has led to a significant advertiser boycott of Facebook. On August 6th, we'll have Lulu Garcia Navarro, the host of Weekend Edition Sunday on NPR. Uh, and on July 13th, we'll have, uh, on August 13th, excuse me, we'll have Yuval Levin. He's a leading commentator, editor of National Affairs, and director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, this episode and every episode will be available on demand at kf.org slash vision. Email us at vision at kf.org or visit us on Instagram at vision.kf. Please take the survey on your screen now. As always, we'll end the show to the sounds of Miami singer-songwriter Nick County. You can find his music on Spotify. Until next week, stay safe. Thanks, everyone.